Aerial bombing has been a thing for over 100 years. It started when some Italian engineers who were probably on some sort of powder that I would love to try slapped a whopping one and a half kilogram bomb on a plane, which for you Americans is about 8.14 cheeseburgers. Then a pilot named... One second. Giulio Gavotti. Giulio Gavotti flew a plane over at... I'm bad. You know what? I give up. Just look at the Wikipedia link in the description. The point is that aerial bombing has been a large part of world history. So I would like to introduce the BF-5 Crater. The BF-5 Crater is a super maneuverable light bomber and fighter aircraft made by, well, me. I'll get into what those fuck-ass words I just said mean, but first a word from our sponsor, me. Please subscribe. Please. I would like to start off this time-lapse portion of the video with a shout out to Messier82. For those who don't know, he is a flyout creator who's much better at the game than I am. So yeah, definitely check him out. He's very cool. First, let's get into some large innovations in technology in relation to bombing, starting with something called Knikabine. So what is Knikabine? Knikabine is a German system used during World War II to help bombers fly and bomb at night. Kninkabein, which means Crooked Lake in German, no idea why, was a radio-guided navigation system that helped bombers find their targets in the dark. The Germans set up two radio stations on the ground. The first one set out a straight radio beam. This was the main guiding beam, like a road in the sky that kept bombers flying in the right direction. The second radio beam crossed over the target area. When the bomber flew through that second beam, it was time to drop the bombs. Bombers had special radio receivers on board. As they flew, the pilots would listen to a steady tone in the radios. If the bomber was on track, the tone would stay the same. But if they strayed off course, the tone would change and the pilots would know they had to adjust. This system worked really well. It allowed the bombers to travel long distances and hit targets accurately, even at night when it was impossible to see anything. The intersection of those beams helped ensure they hit exactly what they were aiming for. But what fun is flying in a straight line? Well, it's not fun at all, and that's what the engineers at McDonnell Douglas thought too. So in 1975, they sniffed a line of cocaine and made this thing, the F-15 STOL MTD. STOL meaning short takeoff and landing and MTD meaning maneuver technology demonstrator. This F-15 was the first aircraft that could be classified as super maneuverable. Fast forward to 1983, we get a look at the Russians who, being Russians, needed to one up the United States. So a company named Mikoyan made an aircraft called the MiG-29. The MiG-29 is a single seater twin engine fighter aircraft with super maneuverable capabilities. The MiG-29 was designed with speed and agility as its top priorities, using a sleek aerodynamic frame to reach speeds exceeding Mach 2.2, and it had a maximum controllable angle of attack of 30 degrees. Fast forwarding once again, we end up back in Russia, but this time in 1985. But now we're going to look at the Sukhoi Su-27. The Su-27, similar to the MiG-29, is a single seater twin-engine fighter with super maneuverable capabilities. However, this aircraft was much more advanced and maneuverable than the MiG, being able to reach a controllable angle of attack of 120 degrees, making this aircraft dominate in dogfights. The SE-27 was also able to reach top speeds of Mach 2.35, giving those flying this aircraft a large advantage over those not flying it. But how did these aircraft do it? Well, these aircraft use something really cool called thrust vectoring. Thrust vectoring is where the nozzles of an engine move and redirect where their exhaust is pointed. This is used in aircraft that can perform high angle of attack maneuvers as well as post stall maneuvers. I've been using a lot of vocabulary that a few of you might not know, so let's do a lightning round so I can tell you what these terms mean. Angle attack is where an aircraft is going one way but its nose is pointed in another. Angle of attack is where an aircraft is going one way but its nose is pointed in another direction opponent in another direction. Oh my fucking god. Angle of attack is where an aircraft huh? Angle of attack is where an aircraft is going one way, but its nose is pointed in another direction. Post stall means an aircraft that is not generating enough lift to keep itself in the sky. A post stall maneuver is usually only possible with thrust vectoring. Now let's get into the differences between super maneuverability and aerodynamic maneuverability. Being super maneuverable means that you have to be controllable in post stall conditions. That's why thrust vectoring is a necessity for super maneuverable aircraft. Aerodynamic maneuverability is where the aircraft uses its control surfaces to redirect the airflow to change where its nose is pointed. That's also why aircraft relying solely on aerodynamic maneuverability are very maneuverable at high speeds rather than at low speeds. <sighs> okay, that was a lot. We're gonna slow down now. 
um, I'm going to finally talk about my aircraft. First off, I was given this idea from Falling Plane in the comment section of my last video. So this is the BF5 Crater. I went through a few different designs, but this is the one that I settled on. It's more leaning towards a fighter design than a bomber design, however, that is intentional. See, I wanted to spice things up with this craft and make it multi-role, meaning it's designed to do more than one thing, which in this case is fighting and bombing. This aircraft isn't too quick, only reaching about Mach 2 before it gets the wobbles, but I feel like speed isn't this thing's main strong suit. What this aircraft is really good at is maneuverability and controllability. Being able to hold an angle of attack of about 120 degrees without armaments, which if we look at the angle of attack of, let's say, an average F-14 is a lot higher. I mean, this thing does only use two-day vectoring nozzles, meaning it doesn't have much yaw authority, but still, it's really controllable. This aircraft is a two-seater. Both the pilot and the co-pilot seats have fully modeled interiors, but the co-pilot's is understandably less detailed because, well, we don't really see that. In my head, the co-pilot would have main control over weapon systems, radio systems, navigation systems, ice cream systems, and general electronics, meaning that the pilot can spend most of their time flying the fucker. Speaking of weapon systems, let's talk about those. In its current state, the aircraft is holding eight weapons. There are four air-to-air -air missiles on the wings, two bombs in the bomb bay, and two 30mm cannons in the nose. The crater, however, does have six wing-mounted hardpoints, but two of them are being taken up by drop tanks, and I really don't suggest getting rid of those until they're empty and you're in the air. One of the cool features on this aircraft is its fully animated gear doors. I know that doesn't sound too impressive, but the impressive thing is that said gear doors don't clip, like, at all. Um, there's also some really cool air brakes at the back with all sorts of funky colors like orange and, and orange and gray and orange. The crater also has semi s ducted intakes. They're not entirely s ducted because you can still see the compressor blades, but eh, it's fine. By the way, s ducted intakes are where the intakes have a little adventure from the opening to the engine, making the aircraft have a lower radar cross-section. Speaking of radar cross-section, the crater has a radar cross-section that would make the A-10 Warthog blush. Anyway, it's time for the montage, so um, enjoy! Fifteen knot thrust at forty-two degrees. You are clear for takeoff. 